And the, the difference between these two is night and day in terms of just what this enables. So <clears throat> if you know, any of you have read about the history of humankind or, or animals, in fact, uh, the time when they developed vision really led to uh, uh, you know, huge growth in the kind of animals and the, you know, what, what they could do, basically. And the same thing's basically happening here in the last few years as well. Um, one of the things that Google let it uh, really changed was photos. I'm sure all of you love to take photos from your phones. And what Google Photos, which probably you take for granted now, where uh, a number of apps now support this, where you, you know, the whatever you take a picture of, it can classify and you can just look for it. So in this case, dogs, uh, you can search for that and just get pictures of dogs. Or even, you know, use your, uh, you know, assistant on the phone to say, okay, I want pictures of cats and it'll uh, find these fun pictures for you as well. So it, on a more, uh, you know, serious note, the, the, you know, there are a lot of other areas that could benefit from the same kind of technology. And vision is one where we've definitely seen that progress a lot more. Uh, this is again a couple of years ago. We are seeing progress in lots of other areas too. The, these are images that are typically, you know, taken of tissue samples or things like that, pathology. And what you're trying to do is really to identify a tumor here, uh, looking at the picture on the left and the right. The picture on the right is basically saying, okay, that these are the parts that seem problematic. And normally, you know, traditionally this would be done by a human looking at this and really understanding what's going on. And now. Uh, you know, the just localizing that there's a tumor in, in this particular place is done way better than by algorithms versus typical pathologists. Again, this is, um, you know, there are pathologists that might do better than this, of course. Uh, and there are, in fact, we've seen improvements by combining both of those as well. Uh, but by this, you know, the level of the quality of what we're seeing here <clears throat> is pretty amazing. And what this allows us, you know, in in some places, people say, okay, will this lead to us not needing as many pathologists or as many folks? Uh, that's usually not true. What what this, uh, you know, there are lots of places, even in India, where we don't have access, you know, go to a remote village, where people don't have access to these kind of, you know, specialists for different kinds of things. And having this kind of, a, uh, you know, application available to them, at a very, very low cost makes a huge difference to uh, what it enables in terms of the quality of life and the health of people there. Uh, the next one's language. Uh, so, you know, I talked about how we can, you know, computers can transcribe going from speech to text. That's made huge improvements. But until a couple of years ago, or maybe less than two years ago, in fact, uh, the difference between what the understanding of the natural language, once you have that text, how do computers understand that and make sense of that, we're still pretty far behind. And so if you look at, again, uh, numbers from 2016 to 2018, this is a squad data set, uh, again, question and answer data set that, that we are building these algorithms to uh, answer those questions in a good way. And it was in 2018 that this made a huge progress and again, came to human or better performance for most things. And, and again, you know, over the last year, we are starting to see a lot more increase in what you can do with natural language, but it's still early days for this. Uh, I hope to see a lot more in this. In fact, that was 2018. Since then, we've seen even more improvements. So uh, this was birthed back in 2018. This was uh, just you know a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, I guess. Uh, a new, the latest numbers, and this is on a newer, harder data set, in fact. So the comparisons are a little off, but the improvements that we've made here are continue to be significant and continue to make fast improvements. So one of the things that this helps, of course, is things we use natural language for Google with search. Uh, you know, the search continues to get better because it understands what you're trying to ask for in a better way. If you write a sentence, it's more likely to understand it now than it did uh, just a year ago, you know, thanks to some of these technologies as well. Um, and finally, I love this example because this really combines uh, machine learning or, or algorithms across different domains. So if you look at this, the first thing it does is really recognize that, okay, here's a picture, there's some text in there. <clears throat> then it takes that text, uh, you know, extracts it out of the picture using something like OCR, 
converts it, translates it to the language that you care about, and then uses you know AR to really display it back right there on your phone. And this is pretty amazing. It, it runs completely offline. You don't even have to be connected to the cloud. It can run on your phone. This is pretty amazing if you're going to a new country where you don't understand the language. I've used it myself so many times. You know, I was in China a couple of years ago. I used it all the time. Um, same in Europe, lo lots of different places. So, so this is great. Uh, you know, we've seen lots of improvements over these years. So what's really driven those here, right? right? What's, what's changed or what, what's helped change these or, or bring about these improvements? And, and usually there's more, more than one thing. I'll, I'll give you my take on one of the, those threats. Um, so number one, I would say, or, or one of the key things there is, is tools. And you know, there you've of course heard. You know, if you have a hammer, you everything looks like a nail. And uh, it, but also what you can do with it depends on what you have, right? The kind of tools you have. And so here's an example from a few years ago, not not too far back. If you've uh, you know you use Python, NumPy, you're probably familiar with you know doing MNIST there. Here's an example trying to do MNIST in NumPy with no other libraries there. So this is sort of the first page. You go third, second page, third page, fourth. You're basically writing, here just going back, you know, you're writing what your computation is, the, the gradients for that, and then finally the training. So something like six screens or more of code that you have to write to make this happen. And you have to make sure every time you write it, you have to make sure you fix the bugs, which, of course, you know, maybe you're a perfect coder and you don't get any bugs, but it still takes time to write this, right? Um, so, so that's one. Uh, you know, here on the right is Jeffrey Hinton, who many of you might be familiar with, Turing Award winner a couple of years ago for his work in deep learning. His favorite tool is MATLAB, and that allowed him to really explore all the different things that he wanted to do and continues to do, in fact, deep to this day. He, he explores different kind of ideas in MATLAB. That's the first thing he tries out. And uh, that's changed the game for a lot of people, and it's allowed him to explore things at a very small scale, but, but lots of interesting ideas. Excuse me. Um, so um, th this year is, and you know, of course, Jeff Freehinton has been using MATLAB for, for years, you know, probably the last 20 years or more, uh, as long as MATLAB has been around, I guess. Uh, looking at moving forward a little bit, th this here is the architecture of uh, what's called AlexNet. And this was one of the first uh, you know, deep learning based models that really changed the game for uh, images. And so you know, if you remember the ImageNet thing, this was the first model that came in for ImageNet that really went from, like improved things by 15, 20% on, on that benchmark and really brought deep learning to the uh, front. So that's AlexNet. And this was done by basically using GPUs. Alex Krasevsky, he wrote custom code to optimize things for that and really built his own tools and libraries to be able to run that. Um, a lot of the innovation here was not just in the models because the, the key models were convolutional. The basic idea had been there from Jan LeCun for a while. Uh, but he leveraged that and wrote a lot of custom GPU code to be able to speed that up well on GPUs and then scale that up across two GPUs. So, so that lots of interesting uh, programming things there as well. Uh, fast forward, so, so this one was in 2012. Fast forward a couple of years to 2014 here. You know, if you're familiar with this is Inception, so a much more complex model that has lots of layers, as you can see, it, it comes up with this interesting idea of you have these blocks that are, you know, building on top of each other. Each of those blocks might be its own, you know, bigger block, or as, as you can see, there, there's a lot more going on, and, and you might have, uh, you know, losses in the middle as well. And th this this one was called Inception after, you know, that the movie that came out a few years before that. And this was built using a tool called Disbelief. So th this was. Um, one of the first tools that we built for deep learning at Google. And the idea there was back in 2012, uh, 2011, a bunch of us got together saying, uh, what if we could scale up deep learning to what we can do at, at uh, Google? And how are things going to work? Are they going to work better or not? And so on, and disbelief came out of that. 
And so uh, in this case, Christian Zagadi took, you know, leveraged that tool to really scale things up and train this for I don't know, months at end, if I remember right. And, uh, but he was able to get huge improvements again on the state of the art back then. Then fast forward a, a few more years, this is 2018. Um, and, you know, the, at this point, basically people were able to like, you know, TensorFlow was out, lots of people were using this. Um, there were a lot more interesting things that you could do. And, uh, you know, leveraging the transformer models, folks at Google did BERT, and at the same time, OpenAI was, was building this thing called GPT, which really, uh, both of these made huge improvements over where you could go on the natural language side as well. And, you know, finally coming back to your, the, the MNIST example that we started with, if you, you know, the thing that took like five or six pages, basically of code is now less than a page, maybe 20 lines of code, with TensorFlow 2 that came out last year. And, you know, one of the things here, of course, is that a lot of things that you had to write by hand are already predefined. You can uh, reliably use them, you know, know that they've been tested, that they are being tested, you know, and the likelihood of finding bugs. You don't have to debug them all the time, right? So just, just building and uh, layering things on top of the right way. And so, uh, you know, th that's great. And that's really helped us push the algorithms forward. And as you can see, you know, we've made huge improvements in a lot of these. But um, most of that, most of the stuff I've been talking about has been research. Uh, for some areas like vision and speech, we have been able to deploy that to production pretty well. And to be honest, some of the bigger companies, including Google, have done a reasonable job of being able to deploy these to production, to include them in their products, and that makes a big difference. Uh, as you can see, the products are improving very, very rapidly because of that, if you could leverage that. However, if you just have a hammer, as we were talking about, it's hard to build an entire house. And, you know, you probably need a lot more tools, a lot more stuff, like in this case, he has a drill um, to, to help build things. And there's only so much you can do with the tools you have. So let, let's go ahead and, and see what all we, we need to do. So, so we typically talk about the code that we use for machine learning. Excuse me. And, you know, it's a big, big box. There's a lot of stuff that we need to do. But in reality, that's, you know, a small piece of what we need to do. In addition to all, to the, all the stuff that we've been talking about so far, we need to do all of this as well if you want to really build something that works in production, looks across applications, and so on. And so to make that happen, you know, you need to figure out how to build all these pieces, how to support all of them, you know, starting from just data collection to all of these things. And so if you want to think about this, you know, clearly if this was so hard and everybody had to do each of these pieces, just like the stuff before, it would take, it would be really, really hard. And so one of the things we've done at Google is to, um, you know, really build many of the pieces around this. This is sort of the architecture of what we call TensorFlow Extended, which basically covers all these pieces, not just stopping at the training, which is what we were talking about so far, but really going all the way from data ingestion to uh, you know, building all these pieces and then eventually logging so you can connect the loop and then things around that. And we've you know, made a lot of this available in open source as well. So you can use this and simplify this, these things too. Um, and often people, you know, kind of stop at the modeling part, but there are all these pieces that you really need to think about when you, uh, you know, want models that really work well and uh, can keep working across the board. So let's start digging into, you know, the overall thing and, and see each of these pieces one by one and what they do. So first, data validation. So you have data. What do you want to do with it, right? You want to understand um, how, it is, how it looks. You want to, if you're trying to build a model, you want to make sure that you're building a model for the right thing. So you want to look at the data, and in this case, let's take a look at first what kind of data we have. So, so often you want to look at the statistics of the data. And there's this tool that basically says, goes through the data, you can generate data from that. It automatically tries and figures, it gives you, you know, histograms and other things about the data. And it it's basically trying to understand uh, what's the distribution the data is following? So it can understand, it can see if there are issues around that. And you know, you can visualize it here as well. 
the next bit there is you yes you can see it but it can also infer that the schema for this so for example based on the data itself it can say okay this looks like a floating point value this looks like just bytes or string uh and these are just integers and you know this is starting point again you can uh, modify this and so on so you can leverage that for the next pieces now once you have these two you can leverage that not just for uh, ingesting the data but also for validating it as you go along and so one of the things you might do is once you have the stats and so on uh, you know you can do visual inspection as well of course to see if the stats for the new data match the, the stats for the old data that you had so you want to make sure that things aren't really moving away from what you train the model for if that happens then your model is likely not going to do so well and so in this case you can look at you know ask it to validate the stats for compared to day two versus day one based on the schema and it can tell you you know okay here these these things seem to be off from what you expected um and you know what one of the things this this goes on to help with is training serving skew so excuse me Um, if you are, um, you know, if you build a model and you train that and you're deploying it, sometimes we expect that what we're serving is the same, but it's not guaranteed. You know, what you uh, see in serving, the data that you're seeing in serving is often coming from a different place. You are calling it differently. While training, you're probably doing it offline. While serving, you're probably doing it, you know, online with completely different uh, stuff. You want, of course, share as much as you can. And so, but, but when you, you know, there are parts that you don't share, you want to validate them. And here, what this, you know, validates is basically going back to this one, that the stats that you were seeing in the serving are similar to the stats that you were seeing while training. And if it's too far away, then you want to know that that's going on. And so this is a, a real problem. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, if you use a Google Android phone, you probably use the Play Store. And if you go to the Play app, Play Store app, then uh, you see all these recommendations for you, which basically combines data from you know the, the kind of apps you install, the other items that people have, and lots of other things to put together recommendations for you. And this recommendation recommender system is clearly very very important for us. Um, what what happened in this system though, you know for for exactly this thing, we noticed you know using these tools we found some skews differences between the training and serving. And just fixing that led to a 2% growth in the metric that we care about, in this case, the, the install rate. And so there's a big difference in terms of, uh, you know, just assuming that things are okay versus validating them and finding the issues and so on. And all of these make a big difference in terms of, you know, how the overall long-term stability of your system matters. And so some of these come from, you know, maybe there's a difference between the systems. Sometimes you have a trained model, and then over time, the serving side, or over time, the, the expectations change, the inputs change, but you don't realize it unless you are testing or validating for it, or you're building new models as well. So the next piece here is um, data transformation. Of course, um, often the data that you, the form that you get the data in may not be exactly the same that you get if you want to train on. You want to uh, optimize that for uh, or presented in an interesting way that the model can do a better job with it. And so for that, we have TensorFlow Transform. And that this is basically TensorFlow itself creates, under the cover, it creates TensorFlow graphs once you're ready to deploy. Um, and it allows you to basically compute this similar kind of statistics. The way these are used often are to, you know, normalizing things, bucketizing things, and so on for things like strings, things, you know, um, you know, values that you want to make sure are in a good range so you can, so it's easier for the kind of models that you're trying to build. And the good thing about it is you use it not just for training, but it can also be used afterwards because this, all of this gets deployed as part of what you're trying to deploy in TensorFlow as just a constant thing and, and it gets used there. And so it can be, you know, deployed to training and serving basically as that, you know, at a very high rate. Uh, here's an example of some of the things that people do with transform, you know, doing rescaling, going from strings to integers so they can actually be leveraged for some kind of vocabularies or embeddings um, and bucketizing different kinds of inputs 
even if they are, you know, say text or the say numbers and so on. Here's some more of them for different kinds of areas. Um, another one, there's feature classes itself, and then eventually you can apply it to, to a TensorFlow model. So uh, next is the trainer, which we sort of, you know, all probably think of as the first thing for, okay, if you want to train a model. Um, and there, you know, since for the last year or two, we've really been focusing on the Keras library and that's been fully integrated with TensorFlow 2. And it's available in TensorFlow where, you know, you can build a model and, you know, do the compile fit, etc. And then finally save the model to export it so, it so it can be used with the rest of the pieces. I won't be going into detail of the Keras library itself. There, there's a bunch of uh, material available out there. And, you know, once you have the save model that can be used in the future stages like model analysis and serving, of course. And so, so let's go to model uh, validation or evaluation. And that's, that's what TFMA does. And here the idea is, you know, you can slice your metric. So, so often when you're training things, you train a model, you look at one top level metric. And this is often, um, if you're looking at sort of some kind of accuracy, you might look at that accuracy. <coughs> or you might start by looking at the loss for the loss function that you're trying to train for, or just a couple of things, but really across the data set, right? And maybe that's doing great. <coughs> Sorry. But what you may not realize is that there are parts of the area, you know, there, there are parts of the overall thing that are still doing pretty badly. And so uh, what you want to make sure is that the model is doing well, not just across the board, but even in the different slices. And so in this case, it might show you, you know, different kinds of slices here where, uh, okay, overall here's the stuff, but let me see where, yeah. So it might look at the histogram of the metrics or, you know, different kinds of slices where, you know, on one of the things that you care about, let's say OC loss uh, or the accuracy, et cetera, and make sure that it's as good across the board or even the worst case scenarios either you don't care about or you understand what's going on. And this often leads to um, both improvements in what you can do in the model and, and sometimes uh, helps you identify problems that are there that you want to make sure you fix before you really try to deploy anything like this. And, you know, again, here's the a few different visualizations that you can see on this. Um, skip this, yeah. Uh, once you have the model, <coughs> you, you want to run it, you want to, you know, serve it in production. So let's say you have a, uh, some kind of service and you want to, as part of that, you want to run this model and, and make calls to this. Um, so one of the things you want to do, I mean, there, there are a number of things that you want to think about when you're serving. And so for that, we have TensorFlow Serving, which, you know, you could just run as a server, just, you know, here's, as long as you have a model, just ask it to upload the model and it'll start serving right there. Um, and you can access it from Python or many other languages really, uh, where you just make a prediction with a request on here's the request that I have and you know, with some kind of timeout or whatever, if you want to get it. Um, so you get the response and you're good to go. In fact, you can, you also have a very simple REST API. So instead of having to, you know, you can just use standard HTTP calls to do classification or prediction here as well. And uh, this can be used in many other ways. It offers lots of things, including, you know, updating your models, managing versions, a, a number of different things that really allow you to go pretty easily and simply. And um, in this case, you know, you're doing the REST API port, same thing. Uh, and here's an example running that from curl. So just come online, you can post something and you can get results right there using JSON. So, so that's great. You know, we talked about a lot of different pieces that we can go over. <clears throat> Let's see how they look together again. So we started with TensorFlow data validation. We're looking at the training data and the serving logs. Make sure the data is really matching up to what we expect. Understand that better. And then leveraging that um, to uh, find any kind of anomalies or the, understand the schema itself. Then the, the data in the schema can go to the transform, so you can actually uh, transform your data into a form that's much easier for uh, your modeler to really take in and really build the model on. And so you have 
the, at that point, you have the Keras model that you can use to really build this model, build a graph along the way, it's trained that, and then eventually deploy that out with serving. And before you deploy it out, you can also validate it with model analysis or validation as well. So really putting that all together, you know, you actually have all these pieces available to you and more of these, uh, the other ones are also being made available. For example, the, the Java orchestration and stuff we're uh, making available via something called Kubeflow uh, and adding more and more of these utilities out there in open source. So, you know, if any of you play uh, bowl, if do bowling, then this is a great picture to see. You know, if you're a good at bowling, this is exactly what you'd like to see. And you can probably do that as well, right? Often enough that you, um, you know, get all the pins in there, get, get everything working well. Um, but this is an expert. You know, if you're a beginner, then this is often what happens where you get a ball in the gutter, going outside, missing everything. And this is basically where we are with machine learning, where you know the experts can do great things and deliver interesting results and you know be able to deploy. But it's really hard for the beginners to get things right. And there are just, just too many places where you can shoot yourself in the foot. Um, you know, TensorFlow did that for handle a lot of those for the model building, training, et cetera. And with TensorFlow Extended, we have tried to extend that to uh, take care of a large part of the rest of the machine learning piece. And, and so the idea is to, to have you be happy with that and by basically building, you know, providing the guardrails for machine learning where, you know, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do, things should mostly work. And of course, you know, as you improve things, as you learn more, you can do better. You have all the pieces. You can replace those with customized things as well but really uh, providing you the tools so you can do pretty amazing things with that. Thank you. Happy to take questions now, let me know. Let's see the text. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at the chat. So if you have questions, happy to take questions and so on. Uh, so I have a question. So Sudhansu says, um, what are the challenges of AI in the near future? I think there are challenges in different kinds of areas. So um, one is it's it's uh, very promising, as we've seen, it can make a lot of difference. And so how do we make sure that it's used well in lots of areas? And so you know, one of the challenges I see is exactly the kind of thing I was talking about, where people want to use it but it's still too hard and it needs to be easier for more folks to use it. Um, number two, I would say is um, again, related to this is how do you make sure like across so many industries, how do we get um, more and more people to use this and really change how things are done? And some of that's gonna to happen through evolution where companies that exist today will absorb and you know, learn machine learning and AI and leverage that. In other cases, it's gonna be done by new companies and so on. And um, I would say the third one is really thinking about uh, more ethical uses of AI, something we really care about, where because of these technologies, there's potential for lots of misuse as well. And we need to be really mindful of making sure, you know, if you're using, for example, vision for uh, monitoring what people are doing in a public place, then we need to make sure that we hold the government and other people who are looking at that and leveraging that accountable for that and really use that in a good way. Uh, the next question is on uh, TensorFlow 2.0. Is TensorFlow 2.0 better than 1.0? Um, I, I would say yes, definitely. The 2.0 includes, uh, you know, simplifies things a lot more. It switches from you having to build graphs manually for everything to just running Python code. It still leverages a graph underneath the covers, so it can provide fast performance. 
and you can deploy things to production. But pretty much on every single piece, you know, it, it if you can switch to Tensorflow two, I would say do it today. Uh, it is a slight, you know, there are some changes in the API, but if you're using Keras, the same API more or less works. Um, so I, I would recommend, highly recommend switching to TensorFlow 2.0 the sooner that you can, as soon as you can. Uh, next one is around, are there any direct sure short ways to handle imbalanced classes of data? Um, there, there are a number of ways uh, in the literature and that, that, you know, a number of them seem to work. You can, of course, do resampling and so on. Um, the, you want to be, you do want to make sure is if you, uh, provide a certain, because you're resampling, you're providing a certain distribution to the model while training, but the expectation probably is that if that there, there's an imbalance, it'll show up in production as well. If you want to rebalance or, or apply techniques to, to convert that before you deploy these or before you run them in production or for predictions and so on. But there are a number of ways that, that seem to work okay. I, I won't say they are perfect, but they they uh, seem to help a fair bit, I'd say. The next one from Kamaljeet is about PyTorch or TensorFlow. Great question. Uh, you know, like I was saying, tools are important. Um, in some ways, it doesn't matter what tool it is. Uh, between these two, I would say the differences come from somewhat the history, I would say. PyTorch focused uh, primarily on research. TensorFlow started with wanted to support both, and we still care about that. Um, and so if all you care about is build a model, explore, you know, train a model and so on, PyTorch is just fine. I would say TensorFlow, uh, it was better than TensorFlow 1. TensorFlow 2 is pretty similar. It depends, really depends on what you want to do, right? Uh, if you care about doing, going beyond that, then I think TensorFlow still is uh, a lot better in terms of just the kind of things it has in the production and, and the ecosystem itself. Uh, how do we make AI-based text accessible to more and more people? Uh, that's a great question. That's something I'm really passionate about. And I think it, it's it's at many different levels, right? One is to make tools like TensorFlow better, building more tools like TensorFlow Extended, and, and other things on top of this as well. And there are lots of companies trying to do that as well. Uh, and, and finally, I would say companies, like specific companies building things that leverage AI to to provide higher level services because not everybody is going to take this and you know include it in whatever you're trying to do in day to day. As a beginner, should we start machine learning using Python or MATLAB or any other language? Um, I at this point, I think Python's uh, given. I would say uh, that's the simplest. That that said, you know, from a programming language perspective, I would say. It's good for you to understand how programming works, and in the long run, it won't matter what language it is for you. You know, once you know, once you the first one is hard to learn. Second one's a little easier, but you know, maybe you still have differences. After that, it doesn't matter so much. So, uh, but if you had to pick one, I would I would pick Python today. Um, having worked so much in the field of AI, you've seen it evolve over the years. How do you suggest a beginner to approach this field? Um, so that's interesting. Um, let me think about that. There are lots of things happening, and it's uh, there's so much happening that it feels like it's overwhelming. I would say don't worry too much about that. Start with um, exploring your ideas on a specific problem. Pick, pick any area that's interesting to you. Stick to it for a little bit while you understand the basics. I think there are now with the tools where they are, you can afford to start at a higher level with a library where you don't know all the internals yet and you don't understand all the math and that's fine. I think leveraging some of that to be able to use that. And as you um, use these tools or as you are able to apply them differently, it can add value if you learn the basics too, if you learn the math behind it. It's not a must have, uh, but in the long run it could help you. Um, the, the other pieces to think about for big, as a beginner is, um, you know, I, the way I like to learn in the, the learning styles for different people are different is you're not going deep in one thing, in, but leverage that very regularly to go around it. So, so let's say you're going deep on, you know, vision for a second, right? Or you're know, picking a problem and just trying to solve that. Having that one problem that you're trying to solve is good. 
But as you hit problems or hit things along the way, try to learn what's going on there and slowly start to dig in through. And that, that seems to help. Uh, the next one's from Mabel. Uh, can ML accuracy be ever good enough to replace healthcare specialists with models that can be completely trusted? I think that's a that's an interesting discussion that lots of people are having today. I I, I think the replacing a healthcare specialist is is not necessarily the best way to think about it. I, I would say. Early on, think of it as helping specialists who may be in adjacent domains or are helping them with time or like specific parts of the problem that they're trying to do. Um, would I, you know, a question recently came up was, would you trust a model that is way more accurate than most doctors around you? Or would you still want the doctor? And, you know, one is just, I think the part that we worry about is do we, trust the model because we don't know there are things. Uh, what we don't realize is the same holds true for the specialists as well. It's just that that's a person and so we trust them more. Uh, so from my perspective, I, I would totally trust models and expect them to do be used more and more in healthcare in lots of different ways. And uh, we should think hard about the kind of bar we need for this. There are certain areas that we should start using things today, for example, the, the tumor detection or something like that that I was talking about, we should use that even where we have specialists as, uh, you know, that the specialists should use these tools to make sure they don't miss things, they understand things better and so on. In, in other cases, over time, we'll start to see problems where we can trust them completely, but that's more of a trusted our side than just the modeling. And that said, we, we have to be extremely careful when we uh, do things with healthcare. We don't want to be, um, you know, just deploy models without testing them in a good way and so on. Just like for deploying new kinds of drugs today, we have all kinds of trials and so on. We probably want to go through similar techniques to uh, do experimentation, make sure the models are really, really good. Uh, next one's from Kaushik Sahu. Why aren't we able to do well on text data compared to our accuracy and image data? Um, that's a great one. You know, as I mentioned, that's a, a more recent improvement that we've seen. And wow, lots of questions. So I should, where was this? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to go back to this one. Yeah, so the text one, we've seen improvements more recently. The work on BERT and the follow up stuff seems to be doing really, really well. Um, I think it's early days. I expect to see a lot more improvements in the next couple of years. Presently, we have just a few public available images for COVID-19. In such cases, can ML help ever help with such low data set? So it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, even with COVID-19, there are lots of people who are helping with different kinds of things. For example, uh, it, you know, again, we haven't, we haven't seen the results because it's still very, very early days, but um, DeepMind worked on some stuff where they generated uh, certain kinds of proteins that might work well in you know, vaccines or other kind of things uh, based on the genetic information and so on. Uh, in terms of just a small number of images, there are techniques that people are leveraging to work with low data sets as well. For example, pre-training with similar data sets. Uh, you know, there's ideas around one-shot learning and stuff as well which while not perfect, it's not as good as if you had tons of data, but they still work and they still give you a, a fair bit of value. Um, so it says, what are the current capabilities of artificial intelligence? What's deep learning with AI? Can AI compete with human intelligence? What are the advantages of natural language processing? So, you know, AI is a very rough thing in how it's defined. Think about, can we solve problems that you're not, you don't have to program in some sense? Well, I mean, there, there's some bit of programming in AI, but um, you know, at least the machine learning part of it says, okay, can you learn more of this rather than specifying the rules? There, there's another part of AI that says, okay, you could specify rules and try to mimic what we're doing or parts of what we're doing as well. Right? Deep, deep learning itself, machine learning says, okay, can you learn things from data rather than having pre-specified rules? 
Deep learning is a specific branch of machine learning, which basically leverages certain kinds of functions, which are these you know, layered networks that um, have been inspired by how the brain works. They, that's not really how the brain works, but they're, they're inspirations. And there, there are similarities that we're starting to see more and more. Um, in terms of competing with human intelligence, I, I think um, there are a better way to think about it might be how does it augment human intelligence in lots of interesting ways. And uh, you know, really either take on tasks that are too short or too hard for us to do because you just want to do it so many times. Uh, and finally, on the natural language processing side, um, well, again, can you automate tasks that involve text and so on? Gokul says, do you think machines responding to us by emotions are near possible in future? Um, I, it's That still seems a, a little far out. We are making improvements significantly machines understanding our emotions or based on you know how other humans understand our emotions based on looking at us and so on totally possible uh machines being emotional themselves hard to say you know and hard to say what that might be uh they could learn to respond to emotions with their own similar emotions and so on that that isn't that far-fetched though uh, Deva Pratas says, are there any specific functions available with TensorFlow to facilitate the implementation of GANs like that in PyTorch? Uh, yes, there are a couple of libraries. I'm trying to remember the names. So if you search for TensorFlow GANs, there are a number of libraries uh, around GANs. I think one is called Clever Hands. It's used for res by a lot of researchers at Google for uh, GANs. Uh, there are a number of others as well. Um, do search for that in Google. You should be able to find just for search for GANs um, with uh, TensorFlow, and there are a number of them. Sitesh Pawar, what is the best way to deploy ensemble machine learning models in production? Well, one, um, at Google at least, you try not to have too many ensembles, that they are hard to manage and deploy because there are lots of them. Um, one interesting thing that you can explore is Take that ensemble and do a teacher-student kind of model where you use that to train another model that tries to mimic it and often gets to be nearly as good without being an ensemble, so number one. Uh, two is if you really have an ensemble and that you want to deploy, then well, you have each of those models that you're going to deploy. If you're using TensorFlow, you could use something like Survey, but you would still need the code to really ensemble that and so on on top of it. In some cases, you can... Um, combine the ensemble in a TensorFlow model itself, but it depends on what you're trying to do. Why isn't MLAI as popular in the industry when compared to internet hardware OS? Um, it's, in terms of where it's going to be, I think it's going to be as pervasive as any of those in the long run, but it's still very early days compared to, you know, internet. Internet was created, what, 40 years ago or so. Um, whereas ML inherently, yes, it was created back then, but it's only now come of age in some ways. And so uh, it's it's also harder, at least today, because like unlike an OS, building an OS is really, really hard. And similarly, building new models can be hard. Uh, but leveraging or using an OS is simple because the, the UI that the people see is very simple. And we'll probably see more of that with ML and AI. Gaurav says, um, what's your view regarding the use of AI in the current situation of COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, you know, AI is another tool. The outbreak has is been testing us in lots of different ways. And we should leverage AI as a really powerful tool for things it can do. For example, there, there are lots of simulations that people are doing, uh, some using AI, some without, you know, where they have existing models and stuff, and they're pretty simple. I think in some of those cases, you could use AI. Uh, can you use it for detecting whether patients have uh, you know, COVID-19 or not? Maybe, but the, some of those things take a while as well because we haven't seen anything like this before. It's hard to uh, plan for that and build that. That said, there are lots and lots of folks trying to do things. In fact, there's a, there's a competition, I believe, with a bunch of open data that the governments have been providing and that people can use to build interesting AI models to help with this as well. So if you're interested, do look for that. I think I believe it's on Kaggle, and uh, you can try and help there. 
Raj says, are there methods where trainings could be done on data set of different types, like images and words at the same time to generate a combined results? De definitely. There, there are um, a number of places where we've done that before. Uh, you can have different, so, so the simplest way to think about it is you can have two different kinds of models for each of the, the types. So images can have an image model, words can have a word model for a little bit, for a few layers, and then you combine those and you maybe build another model and combine them in different ways. It's not done very widely yet because it's just hard and, and it's um, often computationally expensive. But I think where we are getting to is you could leverage an existing image model and an existing natural language model um, and then use the outputs of those and combine them in an interesting way. And I, I think we're at a point where we should start to see more of that. Uh, what are your views regarding any AI measures taken in response to COVID-19? I think we talked about this. Uh, how do we educate people to trust models over instinct? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a mix of things. It's not just education. It's people seeing these work well over time. Uh, for example, if you think about something like Google Photos, we are fine with that. We don't have to think about it. We are okay trusting that it will mostly give us the right results. Uh, if you go to healthcare, people start to worry more about it. Uh, and I, I think as we start to show results where it delivers value, where it was hard for people to do it earlier, I think people will over time start to trust it. Vedanta, sir, what, up to what extent do you think that AI should replace human work? Is there an upper limit to it? There's, so there are lots of things today that yes, we as humans do, but they are repetition of the same thing over and over and over again. And those should definitely be replaced, right? They, they help us do other more interesting things that add more value. Now, how far up the chain do you go? It's hard to say, you know, there are, Back in the day, you know, as more mechanization came, as things became more industrial, there were worries about, okay, what's going to happen when uh, there are tractors, now we won't need cows, or somebody else is going to do this stuff, and so on. It's worked out okay. I think in the short term, this will lead to a fair bit of disruption, where there will be uh, places where jobs are lost and replaced by things being done that are automated. But eventually, things should line up well and uh, you know get better as well. So you know, in the short term, this this will lead to to some issues. Okay, we are at nine twenty nine. Let me just try and see a couple more questions. I'm happy to go past if people have time. A few minutes more. Um, Mandava has just to make a machine understand if the image is a cat or a dog. We train lots of data. Do you think? machine learning, deep learning is a scalable solution, or will there be a better solution? I, I think we'll build on what we have. So um, in the long run, I hope to see more of reusing existing models. So for example, cat or dog, you should, for most techniques today, people use an existing pre-trained model and then just train a little bit that does not need the same kind of thing. Expect to see that more across many, many different domains as well. I, I don't, I mean, there are the algorithms that we shouldn't ignore and there are places where they work just fine and we should use them. Uh, but that said, this is really powerful and, and, and is applicable across many, many things. Uh, I'm gonna skip a couple. Uh, Smriti asked, do you feel AI can be dangerous at some time? Uh, we have to be careful about this. We, in the long run, yes, there is a risk. We should be mindful of that. Is that risk today? No, I think that's still far away. There are a lot of other things like uh, job losses that we should worry about a lot more. Um, but we shouldn't ignore this. You know that that would be to our peril to ignore this. So, so we should. Um, you guys want to stop or keep going or? Sir, this is Harsh from NIT Orkila. Uh, I represent Hack and ITR team to thank you for the wonderful uh, session you just gave. I hope we all have a productive uh, time right now. Our time was productive and we all got to learn something. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you. Um, it was a I pleasure. Think, yes, sir. I think we can conclude our session for now. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.